What's going on? It's Johnny King with another episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. And there's been few interviews uh, that I've been this excited for. And uh, one, one just because Michael Gay is an amazing human being. Um, I've heard about him, you know, through Trey Verbaum and a few other guys, but I hadn't actually um, met him until we, we crossed paths at a Man of Civilized Initiation retreat like a month ago, a month or two ago, whenever that was. Yeah, was two months. Time. Two months. Jeez. <laughs> time is flying by uh, down in Austin. And so many cool things we're going to get into. Um, and I, you'll hear me harp and you'll probably hear him harp about uh, how powerful a weekend like that is for, is for men. But uh, dude, the, the way that you hold space, talk about holding that center for men, just your energy. And I also love how you can still like kick it and be goofy and funny and everything else you're actually a, a real dude you know versus being just one dimensional and so yeah, uh, yeah. intense uh, i love how you can kind of shape shift into, into different things for for you know the moment whatever the moment requires but uh Malcolm gay thank you for being here appreciate you all the way from hawaii maui right yeah in maui right now johnny it's so good yeah. to be here thank you man i yeah. really appreciate it these conversations couldn't be more important this time yeah age. Uh, you're telling me um tell tell those that don't maybe know much about you just a little bit more about who you are and all your sure yeah my name is michael gay i'm a therapist in private practice usually based outside of boulder colorado in a little town called lyons been living in colorado for the last 10 years of my life Um, but i got started on this track back in 2005 and 6 when i started attending the tail end of the men's conferences with the old guard with robert bly robert moore maladoma somme john lee and Martin Shaw to some degree. And so got involved in men's work starting way back then in my early 20s, and then set off on a trajectory to uh, be a wilderness therapy guide for six years, which meant living outside, doing really transformational work with teens, young adults, and families in the wilderness, in the high deserts, in the mountain, and um, to really find the ways that the, the wild and the wilderness make human beings live more in accordance with their nature and how health naturally comes from living outside and connecting with other people in that setting. There's something about nature that makes us um, be with each other in a way that's naturally healing. So we don't have to do as much work. It kind of helps us just get into right alignment. And so got to do that for a lot of years and it was a great place to learn how to do experiential stuff. There's, there's just carte blanche, like freedom to really explore uh, ritual, to explore ceremony and these other experiential approaches that you can do and be big in the wild outside. Mm -hmm. And um, also got really involved in addiction and recovery and treatment in that that regard, doing inpatient and outpatient work with folks. And uh, so I was in the addiction recovery world for a while, was a therapist at a a residential program in Boulder, and then have been in private practice and worked with a number of men's organizations over the last handful of years. And um, the main thing that I do with people is lead some wilderness connection work but primarily it's a particular type of group work uh, that's experiential to kind of draw out these dormant, sleeping, intensely vital, blocked energies in men, uh, their grief, their pain, their anger, their fear, um, just all kinds of things that don't have a home in the front country world. And, and what's the wisdom to bring them back out in the open again? Yeah. I'm curious to, to hear, because I obviously got into just, some of this work beginning the the work through my own crashing and burning of my life um right. so that was the impetus which i think a lot of men <laughs> eventually totally. come around to be like okay whatever i've been doing it hasn't been working but yeah. you got into it really young like in your 20s early 20s i did i know, did what was the the driving factor for you just my my crashing and burning happened already it was like in my <laughs> teen, teenage years yeah. there was for whatever reason I believe that certain big pieces of the soul and spirit come in when we're teenagers. And for whatever reason, when that happened to me, I did, my faith crumbled a bit. Um, it was just a hard time. I didn't have a worldview or a belief system or way to make meaning that held me up in the world anymore. And for whatever reason, I'm the type of person that without that, I don't float. Like I don't float in the world without a way to make meaning. And so I just sank like a rock, got in a really dark spot felt really lost. And so from the teenage years on, it was scrambling to find a a life raft. And, um, and it was just, honestly, it was a synchronicity. I think that there's something about the, 
I don't know why it's like this, but when human beings go through intense things, and it's not always, but it has the tendency to potentially call into being um, some really chance meetings to, to catalyze a sort of, sort of magic in a person's life. And when I look back, even though it was so intense and painful, it set a charted course for me to meet some amazing people and learn to do some amazing things. Um, but yeah, the, the ship sort of burned out from under me when I was a teenager. And that's how I luckily ended up finding my way to it early on. Was that a, uh, as a result of your upbringing? Was it kind of your own, you know, you were up to your own devices? Did you have much mentorship? As I, did, to I had an awesome, kind, gentle family, but yeah. I didn't have mentorship. Like my family is a very beautiful, loving crew, but I was like a intellectual kid. I was a really spiritual kid. I took things very seriously. Um, I was always asking questions about things. And my parents were just like, what is this? Like, we don't, we can't hang. Like we yeah. can't think outside of how we're wired. Yeah. And, and I was, so I didn't have mentorship in that regard. And it was flat. I floundered a lot because I didn't have that. And a lot of the places that I sought it, I didn't find it. Um, it really was a trial by fire. Like, Michael, you have to find what's going to float your soul and spirit in this world, or you're going to sink because no one else is going to teach you how to do it. You know, went into the therapist office and they gave me some meds and told me I was a little depressed. And I had the language when I was a teenager. I was like, no, I have a spiritual problem. Like, I do not know how to live without a map of meaning. And they were just like, <laughs> didn't, couldn't meet me there. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't, not used we, to we don't, 16 year olds talking like that. Yeah, we don't have drugs to help you find the, the spiritual map of meaning. Yeah, no. okay, no, okay, interesting, very, very interesting. Um, well, for those that don't know what like experiential, you know, work is, sure, can, can talk about the, the difference between that and yeah, more heady work, neck up work. It's, it's a in a, in a larger context, there's been some sort of pendulum swing. Like as we've gotten more into science and uh, a, a worldview that's so informed by science, it's really um, expanded our capacities of intellect and of mind and of organizing systems and thinking, but it really reduces the world to a materialist plane. And we haven't figured out how to get all the genius and improvements we get from life by, by taking on that worldview but we've, we've lost a lot of things in the process. Um, so we've gained things, but we've also lost some really important vital things. And so the experiential stuff is basically saying like, I mean, it was my lived experience. I went to counseling, therapy, uh, pastoral counselors, pastors, whoever it was with my troubles, and they had no idea how to meet me in that stuff. And I mean, really highly trained, educated, brilliant people I was like, all right, clearly science isn't a place that knows how to hang with the soul and the deep self yet. Um, it helps a lot. There's a lot of counseling modalities out there that are science-based that work, um, but it, it falls short a lot. And so my life became about like, okay, is there, what are the ways that we can pick up the pieces where, where this stuff leaves off? And experiential pro processes are really about getting us back into our full being. Um, stop believing that you're just um, your brain and a nervous system and a physical body, that there's all kinds of complex, elaborate things going on inside you. And to wake that up, it's not a matter. This is the best metaphor I honestly know how to explain it. Like when you're a six-year-old, you can't comprehend what it's like to be an 18 year old or 25 year old that has like an erotic self, a sexual self, hormones, attraction, desire to be in connection relationship. It's just a, you couldn't explain the difference and you couldn't explain it to a six year old. It's something you have to have woken up in you and it just happens. Nature kind of initiates us that way. And so my argument to people is, Hey, there's big sleeping parts of who you are that haven't been put online yet. Or if they are, you don't know quite how to drive the ship. Um, so parts of the soul, parts of the spirit, parts of the deep heart, parts of the connection between that stuff and your physical body. Um, these are all ways that we can learn to access the deep self. And so the experiential approaches are largely body-based. Um, they often happen 
uh, they involve altered states, they involve working in groups, um, but it's something where your truth is something that you don't just know in your mind. It's a, it's a ringing like a bell inside your body, inside the other parts of you, even beyond your body, um, where you become aware. It's like, you know, some, some part of you has been like your foot fell asleep. Whole big parts of the self have fallen asleep due to lack of circulation. So we get the, the vital force circulating into the spirit, into the deep heart. And I'm just like, holy shit, I'm, there's so much more to me than I realized. So experiential approaches are about waking up that capacity inside a person. Like there's so much more of you here. If you got in touch with it, your relationships would be different. Your life would be different. You'd have a lot more vitality. Um, you'd have a bit more agency and control in your life. So the experiential stuff is really what techniques can we use and implement and, and experiences can we create where you will feel that inside you and learn to do it more on your own. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And I, and I feel like I, I mean, what I love about these conversations and why, you know, why our paths even crossed is because I, it's hard for me to, to have conversations with men if I'm not in integrity with doing the work myself, yourself yeah. included, right? You totally. and Dewey and Traver, like you guys totally. are constantly doing the work. I'm constantly doing the work because uh, I keep running into frustrating, you know, uh, roadblocks and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time. Um, and you can use me as an example or anyone else sure, in, in the sense of like, I, I struggle too with like, I know what you're saying is true. And I have touched the, the fringes of that deeper mm -hmm. self from time to time, but I still get sucked into this three dimensional plane of existence that we're, you know, all in. Mm -hmm. And I get sucked into just being a workaholic and busyness. And again, I know I should be able to, you know, make more time for, for some type of mindfulness practice, but I don't oftentimes, you know, yeah. and yeah. then I struggle, <laughs> right. And I beat myself up and I judge myself and that sort of thing. Um, even though I have experienced and I know what you, what you say is true. Mm -hmm. And I think there's other guys that are probably deeply frustrated, if not more frustrated than me in the sense of like, why is it that like, sometimes we, we know what we should be doing, but we don't do it. Is it just because it's hard and difficult? It's a, you know, like, do I have to wait until the whole wall falls down on top of me for me to right. finally like take a step right. back from my life, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. Cause I've, and I say that just because you, you, you're taking, like you said, a kind of sabbatical and yeah in Hawaii in time away, I feel like every 18 to 24 months, I kind of need to reinvent myself same, and have to let go of the old version of myself. And you know, so kind of along uh -huh. that same conversation that we were having before we started recording, but that's a lot of questions. Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> so if the question is how come we have a hard time doing the stuff we know we need to do or that's right for us. Um, usually it's because it involves I think it's because it involves some kind of like a chaotic experience in the masculine archetypes, the warrior, lover, magician, and king. Clearly there's a lot more than that, but three of the four archetypes are doing archetypes. Mm -hmm. Only one of them is a being archetype. And for whatever reason with men, I think there is something to be said for when you're doing things, you, you often, strike this weird balance between like control and, um, and to dive into these worlds that we haven't dove into yet. Like yeah. it's like going swimming and we don't know how to swim. There's something in the unconscious. That's like, if I really wake this up, if I, if I really go into this world, I'm going to feel out of control and I'm not going to know what to do. So much more of our existence is unconscious than we realize. Um, so I just generally think there's unconscious forces at play in situations like that. And they can be a lot of things, you know, self-sabotage, whatnot. But one reason I think that it's hard to dive into that stuff is because it's destabilizing. Yeah. And that's why I really emphasize doing it together. You got to do it yeah. with other people. Um, and that's a way that you outsmart the, the destabilization thing is because you can, it's, if you're in a group, you can get messed up for a little while and uh, they'll hold you together. Mm -hmm. um, but for a, a single ego to go and do all this work on their own, um, I think it's counterproductive. It's counterproductive. It's overwhelming. It's like, it's, you know, I'm a smart enough guy, but I don't even know where to begin, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and, and just even getting into 
shoot, I'm in my early forties now and just working with Christine Haslow last year was just getting in touch with like, oh, this repressed anger, which is a lot of this nice guy behavior. The result of the nice guy behaviors is making me apathetic, making me numb, making Mm -hmm. me stuck in life or unclear because I have all this anger that I'm, that I never even think about expressing. (laughs) It's not even an option, you know? And then you go to a retreat, like the one we did and like, you get some of that shit out and you feel so much lighter and clear and like, oh my gosh, but I I wouldn't even know like where to begin, you know, where, where, where to have privacy, where, you know, what type of container to set up for myself, which to your point, I think is why it's so important to do this work with other men. Right. Right. If, If you're getting like, I say this in general is a lot of people get stuck in a certain place. And I, my, Antidote to stuckness is almost always find some people to do it with you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because there may be something inside you that knows you can't do it alone. Right. Um, and aren't supposed to like you, yeah. you, the roadblock is a thing that requires other people to be with you and help you with. And I have a lot of space, Johnny. I think it's interesting when I look out at the personal growth and self-help world right now, sometimes I get really upset or, triggered at all the like bad advice that's out there um and then i zoom out and i'm like wow actually this is a great problem to have like we were there is some sort of renaissance of consciousness and awareness and it's going to be sloppy at first like we're excavating stuff inside of our psyche and spirit and body that we haven't touched you know i don't know when if ever the last time in human history was we started to try to like look at this stuff and excavate it um the unconscious unspoken bodily things. It's a really interesting thing that we're doing right now that is this cultural phenomenon. And of course, people like you and me and whoever else that are trying to do that work, we're going to get stuck. We haven't had a lot of people go before us and show us how it's done. We're having to make it up as we go. And I imagine that that's the hardest part of innovation. You know, like we haven't, if you think of anything that's built technologies over time, if it's chemistry or engineering or whatever, it gets to some degree you build on the wisdom of the things that came before you. And right now we don't have a whole lot to go on. There's some wisdom that came before us in this department, but man, we're doing a lot of new shit. Yeah. Kind of think about it in terms of this iPhone that we, (laughs) so many of us have, didn't even know we wanted it until, you know, they released it and then we can't live without it, you know? Um, But that's, that is the interesting thing about, like you said, innovation, especially in this world or in this, um, niche um and i agree with you i i i too get triggered i do i too kind of like see like man i don't you know i want to add value and at times i feel just so uh scattered in terms of like where to help you know there's so many conversations so many guys hurting you know and Mm -hmm. and and this is certainly adding a ton of value um having these types of conversations because i do feel like the the whole premise behind becoming kings is just just learning to uh create dominion over your own life right. well, over all the areas of your life. That's kind of the underlying principle of becoming Kings for me. And it's not about ego or showing off. It's just mm-hmm. about getting to the end of your days, feeling a sense of humble pride that you've shown up and you've been able to unmask, you know, or take off all the layers of the, the limiting beliefs and the things that may have held you or previous generations from actually truly showing up. So I think that's the why I kind of love how you show up. And I, and I, and I would say that, you know, it's interesting when I, you know, I went to this retreat for those of you that haven't heard my couple of my different podcasts uh, about this initiation that I went to in Austin where Traver Bohm and Michael Gay and, and Dewey Freeman were there. Dewey is like my dad's age in early, early seventies, such sage wisdom, you know, just, he's, he's, so, so wise because he's been around the sun and he's worked at it um on the other side of the coin though you michael i mean you're relatively young given yeah. you know <laughs> yeah all yeah. sorts of purposes but you still ha- come across as if you know maybe you've had some previous lives where you've learned a lot you know um which i really really appreciate but where did you ultimately learn two questions where did you ultimately learn to be able to hold space like i saw without going into the details of the weekend sure. um with men who are really breaking down and, and working through various things in their life a where did you learn how to do that and b um 
how do you uh, detoxify? How do you, what's, yeah. what's the right word? How do you recoup after a weekend like sure. that when you're just, you know, you're holding up all of these men in such a powerful way who have so much stuff that they're working through, so many emotions. It can be heavy. It just to me, totally. I was blown away with what you guys were all doing as leaders. The way it started, Johnny, was, um, was honestly, it was, to some degree, it was the men's conferences. Mm. It was to see, I think men learn through modeling. And it's very important for us to have uh, an older man who completely breaks the mold of everything that we thought was possible. Mm -hmm. And when I met, you know, Robert Bly and Robert Moore and those, those guys, it did that to me. But to answer your question, really, it was the wilderness therapy work people like the stuff that's inside of us is so fucking big and wild and untamed. And I loved wilderness therapy work because it let people be, let all that stuff out. Like if you think about it this way, if I go into a therapist's office and I have an intensity of like grief inside of me that is unbearable, the the carrying capacity of a therapist's office is is big to some degree, but it's not probably as big as it needs to be to move the grief that I might feel. Like it's way wilder and way more intense than I'm ever going to let flow in a therapist's office. So if the place I go to heal can only let this much voltage come through the wire, I am in a stuck spot because my healing modality only knows how to let out this much of the voltage that needs to come through for my healing. So wilderness work showed me that when you let people get big into their grief, big into their sadness, go through a really big process. I mean, in every way, wilderness sets a scene from that. I mean, these are like young adults or teens. They're like, they're not at their home anymore. They've left home, their friends, their family. It's like, they're getting kicked out of schools. They're suicidal. Like they've almost died a few times or overdosed. Like something big needs to fucking change. Okay. You go to the woods, you're living in the freaking woods for eight to 15 weeks. And you're only writing letters with your family. You're doing intensive group work every day. Um, it's like intense uh, situations allow for that vitality to come back online for the big truth to come through and front country approaches to healing were so fucking tame, man. They were so tame. And I think that it really kept people stuck. So the thing that did it for me was getting exposed to wilderness early on. You know, I'm like a young dude outside and we're working with people who have been through intense sexual assault, who've been suicidal, who have really intense drug problems, who have abusive families. Um, who have had horrible things happen to them in various ways and just started then. I'm like, man, life is intense. No one gets out of this unscathed. Right. Um, can we come up with healing modalities that will meet the intensity of just what it means to be a human and be alive? And so I, I became really disillusioned with the front country healing approaches that were so fundamentally tamed when human nature is fundamentally untamed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's why I love Traver's stuff. You really get, there's an uncivilized piece there. Like, hey, can we, you're never going to get healthy if you can't, like if, if we're a big thoroughbred racehorse and we've got hobbles, like ropes binding our legs or weights on our legs, we're never going to get to feel the fullness of our stride. And I think our healing work is the same. We need to have healing spaces that allow us to take our full shape and in our, whatever it is. And um, so it was that it was being involved in like plant medicine work where it got kind of wild and unruly at times and really big and deep. And it took endurance and a container and a context and a ritual. Um, and like, all right, this is what really heals people. It's not taking like little tiny bites at a time. I mean, that can help, but if you really want to fundamentally change someone, there has to be this big wide open space. So that's how it started, man. It was early on the wilderness work. Everything about it was intense. And it worked and it just sold me that there's other ways to do this shit. Um, and then how I de-stress from it, it was a lot of years, man. Like at that time I was young, you know, I was like 25 going into the woods, people telling me their really intense traumas all week, breaking down, like people that just really didn't have the self-love to take care of themselves. 
and I'd like get out of the field and it would mess me up. You know, yeah. I'd be like, Oh my God, imagine. like it's so heavy. Like, I don't know how to hold all this. And it was just over time. I did have some decent mentors. I did learn to like, let the energy move through my body. And sometimes it still gets stuck and I need to take a break, Yeah. but it, ultimately it's faith. It's like, for me, I can let an immense amount of energy enter my body and being, and it moves through if I have a map of meaning. If inside my being, it's like you take on the bigness and then this is where it goes. If I, if I know that deeply inside myself, I can be in the face of a lot of intensity and it doesn't stay in me and mess me up and drain me. It's like enlivening. Because in the intensity, I mean, you felt it probably at the weekend. When people go into this stuff, you're magnetically drawn to them. It's connective rather than divisive. And so um, when it's really flowing, it's, uh, it feels more like a gift. It feels like a privilege to be around. It feels like a, um, a shot of vitality. Like, oh, this is what life is missing. And I get to be around it. Like, it, you know? Yeah, for me, it's kind of a, it is kind of a returning back to our roots, our, yeah. you know, and, and, and that's why I think I was always attracted out to, Colorado, just for the yeah. the nature aspect of it too. Right. Like you right. said, to be out to be out here, just feel connected uh -huh. out here. And and I, after time, just being in the city, I have to go decompress in in yeah. the woods, in the mountains. So there's a lot of that 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 I think resonates for me too. Um, apologies for the crunching of my two dogs. That was crunching great. on their bones. Yeah, that's what it's about. Um, I know they're happy and they're not wanting me to play with balls or whatever. So it's good. Um, well, that's cool. That's good to know. Cause uh, I've had that challenge as well. Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of a selfish question of like, you know, holding space and being sure. empathetic for men and then feeling like I'm wrecked, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's tough to find that, uh, that balance, but I think that's why I'm even more impressed. You get, you're a professional at what you do because you've learned how to, it's like you work out really hard. You're, you know, you're, you're in training, but you're also, um, doing a lot of that, uh, recovery work mm -hmm. for yourself so that you can be available again. Totally. Right? This is and something I learned from, tough. from Dewey that I'll say, yeah. and, and some uh, Joan Rieger and Steph that were at the Gishaw Institute, is for whatever reason, as a man, I think that a lot of my model of what helpfulness is, uh, or what it like being a hero in the you know, crisis means I need to know what to do. I need to have the wisdom. I need to have the insight. I need to have the magic thing to say, the bullet, you know. Um, and I sometimes that's true, but I don't think that in healing work, that's the hammer you try to hit every nail with. And so much of the wisdom of Gestalt is like following energy and like helping a person get more in alignment with themselves and deeper into their own experience. And if you can help them more fully inhabit their own experience, then the vitality happens naturally. So I don't have to be an expert in telling them what to do or when, why, or how. I just have to help them get in alignment with themselves, play a little bit more of a midwife role. Like in, in birth, a woman's body is the like wise, most holy, brilliant thing from the universe that knows what to do. My job as midwife is to just make sure that she feels supported and like being in touch with that wisdom and you know taking care of some things on the side. But it's like that in personal growth and healing work. And I noticed for me that I would burn myself out trying to always know the right thing to do or say and trying to be the wise sage when I'm, you know, in my 20s or 30s. I'm like, maybe I'll know the thing to say when I'm like 80. But for right now, what I can do is help this person deepen into their own experience. And when I think back on the most healing moments of my life, it was that. It, it was rare. Percentage wise, it was maybe... 15 or 20% someone said the perfect thing to bust me through 80% someone really knew how to help me stay with what was happening inside me and let the energy move in a way that restored my health or my connection to myself or my truth. And so in a way it's like, let's, let's stop trying to be the expert and just help people be with themselves. Joan said to this thing, uh, she's one of the teachers at the Gestalt Institute. Our job is to stay with people where others have rejected or abandoned them or they've rejected or abandoned themselves. And if we can stay with like a certain quality of presence in that space and help them stay with themselves and we're with them too, 
that's um, the nourishing, vitalizing thing. Yeah, I think that's uh, that resonates too. Uh, what I was impressed with for sure is um, you just you just kind of gently asked questions of these mm -hmm. guys when they yeah. were you know processing, and it wasn't so much like um, like interventions per se as it was just holding space and just kind of mm -hmm. working with like you were almost like an artist you're just kind of working with whatever paint that was given to you and you were yeah. you know working with them but it was very much like you said a uh, an energetic thing you guys yeah. were kind of all um float we were all flowing together you know yeah. as well as the horses right yeah it was, cool. really, it really, was cool. really just about doing something that elicited an energy from inside the person or the group that originated in a deep place and then after that, my job is just help them stay with it and expand that energy and it will show what it needs. Um, so it's just, it's a different approach than like the quote unquote expert model that's really popular in, you know, in coaching and yeah. um, in business. Can you also talk to, because I feel like um, you, you mentioned like not feeling like um, the the room of the, the counselor or the therapist is big enough to, yeah, but. you know, uh, I do feel like certainly I've had my, my challenges, but you know, I, other men that I'm working with or guys that I meet at, at retreats, like where I met you too, like there's some like seriously big things that guys need to work through. Right. Totally. Um, I think a lot of these guys that I meet that I can just sense they yeah. have that inside. Uh -huh. You themselves. like feel it and, in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh dude, fuck dude, we got to, we got to get this moving, you know? Yeah. And I feel so badly because I feel like to, to a lesser degree, that's where I was before my divorce, kind of before life pivoted, uh, for me, I guess I, I, I want to, I ultimately just, rather than attempting to coach these guys, quite frankly, I'm like, yeah. honestly, dude, you just need to get to a retreat. Yeah. Like that's, that's, yeah. that's the best advice that I can tell you is like, go to this initiation, you know, yeah. Traver's initiation or uh -huh. something like that, mankind yeah. project or whatever else. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of other ones, but, uh -huh. um, cause there's not a whole lot of talking, like it's, it's good for them to emote and to express like, man, I'm really struggling, but oftentimes there's a lot of like, just victim, um, like I hate myself. I'm the worst piece of shit. Like I'm never going to get them. Like I, I hear you, but that's just a story. I love you. I don't even know that you, and I just can see that, that heart yeah. that you have, but Thanks, they need man. to process and get that stuff out. Right. 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 Um, so what else would you recommend? Or not what else, but for those guys that uh, are really feeling some of those massively huge <laughs> emotions that they just keep repressing, right. And they're scared yeah. to let out because they're uh -huh. scared that they're going to hurt someone or break something, you know, or, mm -hmm. or break themselves and never be able to come back. Totally. You know, there's like comes those like under or unsaid fears, right? Yep. Is it just getting together with other men and, and doing this type of work? Is it is it a retreat? Is it uh, is a retreat enough, or is it just one of many retreats that you do, or is it that 14 week process that you do? <laughs> like totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that ultimately the big goal is to create. And Trevor uses these words, but it's about culture creation. Culture and creation, um, yeah. and so there's stages to that. And one of the first stages is just having experience of how different it can be hmm. and how what happens in you when you're in a place where there's like a lot of health in the group field. Like when you're when you're around the men at the retreat, when you have people that are stewarding that space like me and Trevor and Dewey as as someone who's coming, how do you feel when you're in a place where energy flows that way? Um, so you have people that are leading that are kind of setting an energetic tone. And then as a participant, it, my experience being a participant in the past and then leading now is generally like, I feel fucking awesome and connected and alive uh, when I'm in a group that, that operates this way. I feel more relaxed. I feel like I can be myself. I feel safe. I feel more honest. I feel more um, real. I feel uh, more joyful. Um, I feel loose. Uh, I'm not afraid of my own range. I'm not afraid of like hurting other people or myself. Um, there's just so much more vitality that starts flowing when you're in a culture that has a really good model at its core of like values and practices. So the first stage to me is like, feel what it feels like to be inside of a healthy group because we're group beings, human beings 
our group beings. We're, Dewey talks about it all the time. We're formed in relationship. We get wounded in relationship. We heal in relationship. Um, so get into a group where the principles and the practices and values are, are very healthily aligned. It's like, you know, if you've been eating crappy your whole life and then you eat really good, uh, then like you feel really good. And it's that kind of thing, like you get nourished. And so, and once you are around a group where these principles are in operation, you can't come back to your life and have it be the same. Like once you see it and feel it firsthand, it changes you. And, and um, you know, it's not the ticket, like it's not like you come home and everything's great, but mm -hmm. it's the beginning of the yeah. culture creation. Mm -hmm. So you do, do a retreat, you find out what's possible. Um, and then it's, how do you bring it home? How do you integrate it more into your day-to-day -day life? Probably you need to be around men that know how to create it so that you can learn. If you think of it like anything, like jujitsu, like you see it and you're like, holy shit, that's possible. But then you're not ready to like be a full expert or to teach or to like figure it out with your, your homies. Like you need someone to, who carries some sort of a wisdom or has a lived embodied experience in themselves integrated to lead a little bit. And then, you know, at some point go off and make it on your own. Mm -hmm. So the long-term goal is culture creation. Part of that is transformative experiences or like uh, re-imprinting experiences. Um, like, Hey, this is what's possible. And then, um, and then there's a phase of just like building that skill over time. And then it's like, bring it into your own life with your own group of friends and people where you live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can attest to that too. I just feel like it's just, and why I keep going to these, just like little, you're just chipping away at it yeah. <laughs> little by little, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, as much as I had some major ahas in the first several, like, let's say Tony Robbins events that I went to that kind of opened my eyes to like, Oh, mm -hmm. you know, some other way of being is possible, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's led me towards more, um, kind of deeper, more profound mm -hmm. transformational work. Um, that, that, that's so important to at least be able to see, like you said, like, Oh, like here are men who are in integrity they are congruent. They are mm -hmm. happy. They're not just bullshitting. They're, yeah. um, you know, okay. So if that's possible for them, you know, what's, what's possible for me, but it doesn't come overnight. Right. right. Um, is there, a, is there even like a linear path that, that a man can like talk about a flow chart that we were saying earlier, you to kind of, cr you create, uh, deep structural change you know yeah. and have it not just be like i said up intellectually up in our heads totally. but is there a path that you know you can kind of see or mark or or, or or yeah exactly kind of see that a guy is on like oh you're you know a third of the way there or totally you've just begun to scratch the surface like the image that comes to mind johnny is like a a backpack. I'm like, okay, you, every man's going to go on his own journey, but I can tell him some things he should probably have in his backpack yeah. as he goes on it. Yeah. And um, I don't know how backpack. exactly when he's <laughs> going to like use the different tools on the way, but like yeah. one of them is transformational group experiences. There you go. Like yep. got to try those. Um, another is doing things that are nonverbal and non-cognitive. Um, such as? Such as art. Uh, yep. dance movement yep. music yep. um breath work um responsible plant medicine circles or use um uh dream work like things that really uh bioenergetics practices core energetics practices uh that work really with the emotional body and physical body combined um so, and that's maybe the most underrepresented thing that I see in the personal growth healing world mm -hmm. is, is a, it, and it's, there, there are more coming online, but you've got to do some things that are non-conceptual. Like there's like, that's why we bring in the horses. You can't fucking like think your way through a meeting with a horse. Like it's a purely energetic experience, but it also teaches you about relationship. It's a living being. You're going to remove all your thoughts. You're going to remove your concepts. Um, and it's all about energy. So just things like that. And there's a lot on the, you know, choose five of the 
500. Yeah. yeah, right. But do things that are nonverbal and non-cognitive that work for you. Um, and so, uh, so of the masculine archetypes we talked about, like the warrior, lover, magician, king, mm -hmm. the lover archetype is the one that's the, the being archetype. Right. So pretty much anything that you can do to get yourself into the lover archetype is going to help. Like art, poetry, dance, uh, creativity, um, relationships, sexuality, um, breath, uh, like trips and exploration, like vacation, like uh, aesthetic experiences that of like rapture um, or of like connection or beauty. Um, like how much beauty can you hold in your full being? Um, things that re that that imprint you that way. So it's like lover archetype things that come in. Um, another would be eventually constructing like a group that's personal to you. Like so often what happens with men is like they have their friends and they go to do personal growth work, but at home, like their main outlet is their partner. Um, and there are friendships they don't necessarily get down in the ditches with. Um, so what I would love to see and be a part of is creating a culture where men do that more with each other. Um, and so usually for whatever reason, like men need training wheels at first. So that's like choose, you know, five to nine men in your community, or like maybe, you know, three or four, and then other men can bring other men, but go read a book together. That's about this stuff. That way you have to talk about your ideas and men can be intellectual and philosophical, but then also talk about your personal experience, like read Iron John together, read Traver's book together. And usually after you've read one or two books together, you'll know each other well enough that you don't need the books. And when you get together, the stuff just naturally happens. Um, doing something like reading a book together holds enough structure for men to get to know each other, get through the awkwardness that's for some reason there. And, uh, and over time, like the intimacy comes and then you don't need the structure anymore. But th that's part of the map to me. Transformational group experiences, nonverbal, non-cognitive altered states work, um, and then bring, finding a way for you to have this in your day-to-day -day personal life. Like it's like a non-negotiable. And I think it'll give more to you than a lot of the other stuff that people put energy into. If you have strong group support and connection that's consistent, that's personal to you, it's not just your personal growth group, that's like these are your people that live down the street or across country that you can call that are your friends, um, that changes everything. Yeah, definitely something I've been working on building just, again, for myself here in Denver yeah, is that totally the, the community of, of guys because I just felt that need, you know, just for myself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, apart from business, just needing that tribe. So that's, yeah, that's cool. The it's affirming for sure. Um, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, and I'm, I fall into this group as well. A lot of coaches out there, yeah. <laughs> um, Christine Hazler and Stephanos and, and, you know, uh, other people kind of, you know, there's a lot of, they would kind of refer to them as like one trick pony coaches, sure. you know, mm -hmm. who, you know, and I'm, and I'm, that's why I'm kind of in school right now, kind of learning to take things deeper into the, into the body. And, uh, and I'm enjoying that, that education. But uh, who are that, who are, I mean, other, other than the guys that you already mentioned, sure. who are some other people that you respect who are doing work similar to you that you look up to that you have as your kind of like in your inner circle yeah. um, that, you know, are just good people that uh, the guys are listening to this should follow on social media or sure. uh, read um, content and that sort totally. of thing. Totally. Uh, Jeff Brown is a guy that's up there. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal in every way. His books, his, um, his Instagram posts, just like a really great in integrated version of authentic emotional expression, connection to the body, to authenticity, a real resistance to a lot of like um, dehumanizing new age um, concepts and, and ideas what's a really deep, soulful, um, spiritual, uh, relational human being look like and feel like. I think he's phenomenal. Um, and he's still very accessible, which is a great gift. Um, I think that someone else for me is someone who really speaks to the mythic and like revitalizing the mythic dimension of life would be Martin Shaw. 
like in, anything, any of his books, um, going to an event where he's telling a story, going to a storytelling school. Um, I think that it, all of this changes when we get located in a bigger mythic context. And so much of the confusion we feel is because we don't have that real compass bearing that goes beyond the human, that puts us a part of a larger matrix of life. So Martin Shaw would be a great person um, to read, to explore. Um, I think that some of the old school people that have passed on, um, there's some people that the only access we have now is reading them, but like Mary Louise von Franz, uh, Mary Marion Woodman, uh, Clarissa Piccola Estes, she's still living and uh, teaches workshops every now and then out in Loveland, Colorado. She wrote a book called Women Who Run With the Wolves, is a very gifted teacher and storyteller. Um, and I think that it'd benefit anybody alive, man, woman, whoever to go and like study with her. Um, she's one of the, the brilliant people we have still. Um, I think that Alexander Lone has passed, but that's someone we really need to take a look back at. Uh, he created a form of healing called bioenergetics. He was a psychiatrist, he was an MD, but invited people to move their their repressed emotional material through the body in certain ways that retort, restored a lot of health and healing. So if we could all get on a kick of reading old Alexander Lowen books, you know, depression in the body, love, sex in your heart, um, things like that, it would be a game changer. Um, and I think that the wild, like all of us need to really brush up on our connection with the wild. Like that's, that's the real mentor and teacher. Do you know how to let the wild be like a living presence in your life that you are held within that that basket and um i mean i think that that's if we're just bouncing around inside our own psyches we're going to be very limited um, and I, th I think that a connection to the wild is is imperative yeah um as far as people i'm looking to i think the, those are the ones that that really stand out to me right now yeah yeah, I love that. I need to look into a lot of those. Um, yeah. And what you just said too, you know, I, I just finished recently watching uh, Alone, which is a, you know, a yeah. series on Netflix. Totally. If you watched it, yeah. I have, I've heard about it. Yeah. And I just, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty powerful how they, you know, work to survive up in the Arctic Circle, you know, into yeah. the winter, you know, by yeah. themselves surviving on the land. And I think um, so many of those things that I glean from that series is like, I often kind of feel like I go into the wild, yeah. you know, I go into like, I, I live in a city and I go into the, but then I'm just kind of trudging through nature uh, or have this relationship with nature versus being of nature, you know? Totally. And I've been, I've been working more on that idea of like, you know, in terms of one massive organism, we're all just pieces of the bigger picture, you know? Um, so a lot of what you say kind of resonates in terms of just like getting out into the, the woods. And I think that's why it resonates for me too. So I appreciate that. Um, one of my last questions is like, you know, obviously you, you're holding space for a lot of men and that sort of thing. But I, like I said earlier, you're doing the work too. What, what's something that you're really working on this year, 2022, that uh, that's a challenge for you or that you're excited to, to see what's around the corner? <laughs> I'm sure there's some totally there yeah totally i think that. that um a big theme for me has been uh and still is and i'm, I'm still in the middle of it that uh our shadow might also hide inside of our virtues that might be a very tricky hiding place for um, our shadow um, when we, when we are really convinced that we're being good or the best we know how to be, or we're being boundaried or compassionate or whatever it may be, that that our virtues might be a hiding place of our shadows. Also, we might use our virtues to like deflect or smoke screen something that we're unconsciously totally. um, doing, and uh, and that's such a hard one to catch. Um, and it's so vulnerable to like go there because our virtues and values are the things we trust the most also and create the most safety and order in our world. Right. And to think like maybe there's something shitty inside me that's like using that 
in a shadowy way, like, whoo, that's scary terrain. And I don't like people mirroring that back to me. And um, is that true? So like, that's a growth edge for me and something that I want to explore long-term. So what are ways that we can look at our shadow in the way that our virtues might keep us from seeing um, that because we, we unconsciously hide there. Um, can you give an example either for you personally or just sure but you've seen in the work yeah. done with men? Um, if I'm in an argument with someone and I feel like uh, slighted or like my, my experience isn't considered, um, I can get really righteous in insisting that like, these are the rules of relationship. Like, I, I need you to try to empathize with me. I need you to try to hear. You didn't reflect or validate anything I said. And I'm not looking at the charge that I come with. Like I'm enforcing my rules, which creates safety. I know I felt wrong but I'm really unaware of how intense I'm being in like enforcing those rules or the amount of fear that's inside me that drives um, my desire to have like an order and a structure to things. Mm -hmm. And um, so all I can see is like, you're not playing by the rules of relationship, um, which is true. Like I'm not wrong. Like the rules of relationship aren't being played with, but I've got no awareness of my level of like anxiousness or resentment or fear that's mm -hmm. like um, in my body coming through in my words, scaring that other person, making them feel unsafe, um, not wanting to trust me because I'm so like rigid and charged around these like rules and boundaries and um, these principles that should be defended. So that's, that'd be an example. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Um, I interrupted you as I don't know if you remember what you were gonna say after that. Ah, uh, just like yeah, just looking at that, and then the final piece. You asked me what I was working on, yeah. and that, and then as as nature connected as I have been in the past, um, the honest piece is I've I've gotten disillusioned uh, on that to some degree, and I have some repairing to do of my own connection to the wild, and so I, that's part of the reason I came to Maui is like. I had some dreams that guided me here and it's my job to really be empty and like, listen to the land while I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I have to work with like, why I don't want to do that. Um, when I know it's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm not allowed to like, say, I want guidance from the universe. And then I don't go out and like, listen for it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a hum, slice of humble pie, man. Well, I think that's, that's a lot of what I'm going through too. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of, a lot of listeners are too. It's like, I'm yeah. disillusioned by certain things that, uh, yeah, I, I, I say I want mm. something, but then I'm yeah. not, I don't do it, you yeah. know, or I say I want it, but then I, I find myself doing other things that I clearly am using to avoid going into those areas, you know, the very thing I ultimately want. And I'm avoiding it, you know, yeah. I'm like, Oh, there's a lot, there's a lot there to unpack. So yeah, that, that resonates for sure. So um, tell about where guys can connect with you. Obviously you have your, your practice, your counseling, you have, sure. uh, you're doing retreats. Like I'm so grateful obviously yeah. that our, our paths across, but um, you know, if they're not trudging through Maui, uh, where can they find <laughs> totally. you? you know? I mean, right, right now I'm in a little bit in recluse mode. I, I, yeah. I off and on have openings in my private practice. Um, but mostly it's through my website. It's michaelgaycounseling.com. And then uh, I'm not that active on Instagram, but you can find me there. Um, you know, one day I probably will be, but it's just not right now. I'm, I, I spend a lot more time just kind of floating around outside with, with the trees and the whales here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the website's the way and, um, and I'm, I'm totally open to what I do love is even if people don't want to work together, if they're just like, where do I find out more about this? I love being a resource for people. Mm -hmm. And so if that's a short phone call, if that's uh, responding to an email, I love people reaching out in that way. So you can feel free to email or call and I'm happy to respond in that capacity. But right now, the main way that, that people are going to get to work is um, coming to a retreat with Dewey and Traver. Um, yeah. We'll probably roll out some trainings uh in 2023 um for people that want to dive deeper into this experiential group work i love it that's awesome yeah. the next uh the next retreat is here in colorado correct yep. august 
August. Yeah. Um, I'll put uh, links of that stuff into the show notes as well as I continue to promote it for sure. Um, but I love it. So guys, Thanks, if you're, man. you know, want to connect with, with Michael, you can definitely go to michaelgaycounseling.com and just check out his psychotherapy, his men's work, his events, all the various things that he has on his website, which I think are really useful tools to at least, you know, use that as a, as a beginning <laughs> guide for you. Um, Michael, thank you, man. Thank you for taking time. It's great to be with for, you, man. Thanks so yeah, much. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. It's good. Yeah. I think there's so much more we could kind of dive into on a deeper 202 level, but this is a great kind totally. of uh, initiation for, for introducing you to those that maybe hadn't heard or Thanks, known man. you before now. So appreciate the I appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Guys give, uh, give Michael a follow, even if he's not super uh, active on Instagram, he will be one day, I will be. maybe 50 years from now, um, <laughs> but just wait. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you want to reach out to me or if you want to connect with, uh, or I should say, reach out to me to connect with Michael, if I, if I can get you in touch with the nation, anything else where, uh, where Michael and Dewey and Traver are doing their thing, please do. You know how to find me. <laughs> and thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. Enjoy the day. Take care. Peace.